Bill Dill. And you know why? Because his audio matches his video. And do you know why? Is because when he says, says something, he most likely has experienced it. He's done it in a world where we've got a lot of swank or wank and nothing in the bank, in a world where we've got a lot of people that get up on the platform and say, listen to me, I'll show you how to become successful when their lives are actually in pieces and they've actually got no business that they've ever built up. This man here has done it. How are you going, Mark? Tikanis, Tommy. Tikanis. <laughs> to everyone that can't speak Greek, that means... How you going? How you going? Hey, listen, not bad. you 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 can I can I ask you if you were in Greece at a cafe in a village, could you converse and have a conversation in Greek? Um, as long as it wasn't about politics or complicated stuff. So like my, my dad came to Australia in 1948 and him, him and his five brothers, and to be, and to be frank with you, um, they still speak speak the same village Greek they spoke then. So in other words, if I was in Athens, like I've been there in Athens with my dad and uh, we find it difficult to speak in, say, at the, for the Grand Breton in the cafe. It's a bit difficult because they speak sort of swanky Greek. Um, but back to the villages, particularly if it's around the villages in Peloponnesto, where, where, I, where we come from. Yeah, I can probably have a fair, fair conversation. Mark, can I ask, when was the last time you went to Greece? Uh, not last, obviously not last year, not 20, but uh, 19, 2019. Okay. When, when you go to Greece and you go back, um, and I'm sure, you know, you, you, go to, you obviously get off at the airport in Greece and there's Athens and you might go to a few nice places and then you, you do visit the place your, your, your parents were from? 100%. So, well, actually what I do, Tom, is normally what I do is I get off the plane, I rent a car, and I, even if I haven't slept, I drive straight to the, the, the village. So... I drive, yeah, I, I do that part first, get that sort of not over done with, but get that part done first. So I actually like the drive. I don't, I don't really want to hang around. I'm not an island guy. I'm not, I'm not, a, I don't hang out in the islands. Um, so my, my family from the mainland, from yeah. the mountain, and, you know, relatively speaking, poor and, uh, you know, very rocky and not much going on there, but that, I, like, I love it. It's, I love to go there. It's beautiful. Now, Mark. Congratulations, by the way, because by coincidence, in um, in today today's press, I think it's today's press. The message I got from you shows the book that you recently uh, had published is uh, number four, Rise. We're going to touch on that. Um, can I ask you, in in your own words, when when did you write Rise? Was that written uh, last year? Yeah, last year, from about uh, April, it took a long time, but April through to about the sort of towards the end of September. And I was sort of proofreading it again about uh, October and then just, you know, just checking, you know, spelling and stuff like that um, as late as November. And there was a mad rush to get it out and everything. Um, it, was, it was out released last week. Okay. Congratulations, number Thank four, you. right? Congratulations. And it's really, really good to have books that get to the top there uh, from people that have actually got an experience, have felt the pain and suffering of what it feels like to run a profit and loss report, what it feels like to try and work out where's the money going to come in that I'm going to sort of have to pay my overheads because there's a lot of people that are really good at writing books that actually haven't done what the book says. So congratulations on what's... But if you had to say in your own words in a minute, what is Rise all about? Uh, well, Rise is a couple of things. So uh, in one minute, it was... Uh, Originally conceived by me, um, the, ob the objective was to try and let people know what I've experienced as starting off from a small business. All businesses start off small, starting off as a small business and building into a large business. So I deal with things like, you know, ambition, patience and uh, all the things it takes and also the skill basis, but all the, th the things that it takes to build a business from nothing to something. And I talk about all my failures as well. So I, you know, I address all the failures. Um, and then I, that's the first part of the book. So I really want to give people some tools. And the last part of the book is talking about um, why don't we do something about uh, the world as, as business owners and or people who work for themselves. And I want to redefine that. We all work for ourselves. Even if you're working for the man, you're, let's say you're working for the tax office, or you're working for one of the banks, you are working for yourself at the end of the day. I mean, you are contributing to them, but you're working for yourself. So what I'm saying is we all should rise, rise up, form one group and make sure we're well looked after. And what I mean by that is, 
address all the issues that business owners need to address and do it as one group, one momentum with some political power sitting behind it. Okay. So you believe the book is hopefully um, a catalyst and influence for a movement of people um, to work collectively because it will be far more impactive than working in isolation. 100%. 100%. Well, look, at the, at the moment, we got a, a liberal co- country liberal or national liberal party, right? Well, they they sort of, there's an old party, Labor Party is an old party, and they were, they were built like, you know, or conceived 100 years ago, or whatever it is, less than that, but something like that, um, whereby they represented a movement of people with similar interests. I think um, us as a democracy, as voters, We've moved away from where those parties are. Those parties make their own decisions today. They don't necessarily represent all of us. So I'm just saying as a simple start, for all the 2.2 million small business owners and self-employed out there and contractors and real estate agent guys, et cetera, why don't we start a movement? Let's just see how we can run this in a political sense. I don't mean running for elections. I don't mean that. But actually telling them what we think about what they're doing. Okay. Mark, do you have to be... Do you have to be an asshole to win in business? Um, no, and and I, I do talk about that in the book. Um, some people think that you have to be a ruthless bastard in running your business and climb all over everybody who gets in your way in order to succeed. In other words, and, and in some cases, use treachery um, as one of your tools or one of your skills. Develop treachery as one of your skills. I don't accept that as a proposition. Um, it might work to get you to the top. It might allow you to stab a few people in the back on the way up and nail a few people and get into the role that you want to get into, but it does not allow you to run a business. Today, businesses are about collaboration. That's what's things, but you don't have to be an asshole to have drive. Um, and drive today is not about saying, you do this. Drive is about saying, watch me. I Can I inspire you? Why don't you do this? It's about that. It's about inspiration. It's not about being difficult. Ruthlessness is not about being a shithead. Ruthlessness is about being leaving nothing on the table in terms of what you do. Be ruthless about everything you do, about your discipline, about your your timetable, about uh, what your what you know about your subject matter, and uh, how you be ruthless in every, in your discipline about how you approach everything you do. That's where you can be ruthless, but in relation to yourself not in relation to anyone around you. So it's 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 funny we're talking about this because during the week I was reading some uh, literature. It was more academic literature and they were looking at the subject of narcissism in leadership. And what they found is that, in fact, there were a lot of leaders that showed elements of narcissism and narcissism appeared to be something that had been useful in their uh, growth, getting to the top, but, and then they use Steve Jobs as an example. When Steve Jobs was at Apple the first time, he was a lot less humble than what he was the second time. Second time he came back, like he was a little bit different. The first time he was, um, an ex- he was a totally different character. And you said to me off air, oh, look, that sort of a little bit of the Trump there, you know, when you look at the, the Trump, because um, um, to get the job, he must have been super ambitious. The Trumpster does show signs of narcissism. And look, to some, ex- to some extent, there's been a lot of very successful people who have risen to the top, become CEOs of really large organisations. And, you know, like a good example, as I recall, is Al Dunlap, for example. I don't yeah. know if you remember. Up at Al Dunlap did, and he, cut, he was a cut, cut cut cost king, wasn't he? he would go yeah, in, yeah. Kerry Packer brought him in to sort of try and sort things out in relation to some businesses that Kerry was involved in many many years ago, a long long time ago, and uh, and in the end, and, and he and then he went back to Sunbeam, I think uh, um, Al Dunlap, but he ended up getting cut because of that um, narcissism or that nastiness as well. Like everything was around about himself, and I think narcissism does aid in your ascension but it doesn't help maintain your position, um, as I said earlier. And Trump, uh, Trump's is a great example. And, and there are a lot, there is a lot of, a lot of studies on um, psychopaths or people who have risen to the top who display psychopathic behaviour. Narcissism and psychopathic behaviour are sort of uh, brothers or, you know, or are related. 
And but at the end of the day, the psychopathic behaviour, meaning they are have no feeling for anything, good or bad, um, can tend to work against you when you have to actually work with people and customers, more importantly. Yeah, it's funny you say that because in real estate, what I notice when you're a solo lone wolf in real estate, um, that kind of trait can actually get you towards the top. But then when you want to sort of amplify yourself and build a team, what happens is that's where it seems to fall apart. They can't keep their staff or their staff actually um, have got no trust with them. So that ain't, you know, play, play the best that they can be. So it appears that when you need to bring in collaboration with a lot of people, that's where uh, it probably goes the other direction. Well, you know, it's funny. A narcissist um, displays a couple of features um, uh, so or behaviours, and the response is either, you scare me, so therefore I'll do whatever you tell me, Mr. Narcissist. So, you know, the narcissist will get the result from you, but you won't get the best people. Or alternatively, you don't scare me, but I'm going to suck up to you. But all of a sudden, I, I become a suck. So, like that's not necessarily the right person for, an, for you to have in your business working for you either. Um, and I think, and, and we live in a world today, and one of the things we take out of our social media environments today is we live in the world of likes. Um, and to be frank with you, there's nothing wrong with them. Actually, people, you've got to be liked. I mean, for me to be an influencer on LinkedIn, I've got to have people like me, like what I say, like what I stand for. And people uh, find you out, work you out pretty bloody fast. So if you're a narcissist, I think I mean, it might help you get to some position somewhere in some organisations or some places, but you won't maintain your position because we are this today, our community is all about liking people and, and no one works for you if they don't like you. Tommy, you know this as well as I do. If I've got A here and B here, they're individuals, they're both real estate agents, they both walk into my house to try and get my house to sell you know they both want to sell my house but they're both from different organizations and let's say they've got exactly the same skill base exactly the same history exactly the same um you know numbers in terms of sales etc and they know the area really well i'll pick the person i like the best it, it comes down to that i mean yeah. i'll pick the dude that i like best i'll say well i like you better I'll, I'll i'll take her or him because i like that person better i just like them they, they empathize with me. there's something that's a connection and a narcissist rarely connects really now, now mark a lot of the real estate community uh, that i deal with mainly um even though it wasn't real estate that you actually spent a lot of your life with it's in um, finance and mortgages um and uh, by the way uh just in case you don't know he's of course the chairman of yellow brick road and um and i think that when you buy the book you'll be absolutely fascinated to know that this is a story like most people would know suburbs like lakemba and punchbowl mainly because it's covered in the press because of you know crimes and violence and shootings um, um mark was brought up in that area up until the age of 15 or 16 and i uh, went to uh punchbowl uh, boys high for most of his uh, high school years so what you'll get out of the book is the fact is it doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter whether you went to Cranbrook or whether you went to, you know, Bankstown High. I think that, and, and can I, ask, so Mark, let me ask you, do, do you believe, like, do you believe the guy at Cranbrook has got an advantage over the guy at Punchbowl? Um, not in an academic sense, no. No. Um, as long as the person at, uh, at as long as the person at punch bowl has a good stable family structure yeah. and are properly encouraged by their parents to like, you know, people like me and my generation were encouraged to uh, do something better than my, my father. So we went to university. So um, no, no, I don't think so. Where there is an advantage, because my boys went to Cranbrook or three of my four sons went to Cranbrook and what the other one to Scott's, um, where it is, there is an advantage in that is they do have good networks. I have to give it that. Um, not many guys from my school or in my class did all that well. Um, and and nor do I have business um, communications with them today. Yet I look at my sons who went to Cranbrook and they've all got some connections from blokes they met at Shaw or Scott's or wherever. wherever. So, But it didn't make them better people. It didn't make them better academics. 
they didn't get better results. Um, they didn't get into better universities. They didn't get a bit into better courses. So that's up to the individual and that individual's social environment, their family environment. That, that's what I think. And, uh, and, I, and I like, by the way, Tommy, I've got a grandson now. And I said to my son, um, Alex, I said, and George, my grandson is George. He's um, what, um, three now. And I said, for my money, I probably wouldn't invest the amount of money it takes today to send him to a private school. Um, I'd probably look at spending that money on other things in their education program. They get them, learn them to be able, be, be able to speak a, another language, get them to be able to play a, a musical instrument, spend the money on that, and maybe learn, get them to learn a computer language as well as their schoolwork. So I'd spend money on tutoring them as opposed to spending money sending them to private school. That's my view. If you can remember back, when you were in like year seven, year eight, did you in your, like, I know, and you're the sort of person that thinks, hey, I've done pretty well, but you don't, you're not the type and say, mate, I've crushed it. But, you know, you have done well when you look at the median of what the population does, you have done well. Did you remember when you're in year seven, year eight, year nine, did you think to yourself, man, there's big things coming in my life or did it no. just happen? No, I did, definitely didn't think. I had no idea. I mean, like, you know, I got a, a dad who who's had you know, at that stage still an accent, accent and he worked in a, you know, never been to school and he worked in a factory as a labourer, process worker. I had a mum, my mum was Irish background and they, you know, they sort of met each other here, obviously, but, uh, um, uh, you know, she, she, you know, she was just a, a normal person, you know, she didn't have a great education particularly and, um, um, you know, mum worked in the pub you know, do whatever she could do to make a quid for us. Um, so the answer is uh, definitely not. I mean, I was just a kid growing up and like every other kid, but I was very competitive, Tommy. Uh, like, like I was incredibly competitive in everything I did, not just in sport. Everyone just associates competitiveness with sport. I mean, I was competitive in my sport, but I was competitive in, in the classroom. Um, I, I wasn't particularly studious. Um, and I had no map in my mind that I want to become an architect or a lawyer or whatever. Um, I had no understanding of those things, to be frank with you, um, but I was very competitive. So if I didn't get, you know, like close to the top mark in a, in a, a subject, I would go and do it. I would go and study harder. And I, wa I'm not, I wasn't a goody two shoes. I was in more trouble than the early settlers. Like I was always in trouble, um, but, you know, like fighting and shit like that. But, but I, I just competed. So, and then that comp competitive nature sort of was always with me. So I guess for me, Whatever I did, I was always going to be pretty good at it because I was lucky enough to have, you know, the ability in most things. But then I, on top of that, I, I would always compete and try hard, not just work hard, but try hard. Um, and the, there was or what I needed was one opportunity, one person in my life, the biggest influence in my life, one person to make one important move for me that set me on the path. And that was my mother. She dragged me. I didn't want to go to university. I had no interest whatsoever, but I did well in the HSC. And I got into whatever course I, you know, many, any, whatever course I wanted to. My mother dragged me to the university and she enrolled me. And then I became competitive in that environment and I did well. If my mother had not had taken me to university and enrolled me, I was going to become a brickie. Now, who knows? I might have become a really good brickie. I might have become a builder. I don't know. But still, I put down that one move by, that one influence by my mother. And literally, Tom, she dragged me there. She said, get in the car. We're going to the University of New South Wales. You've matriculated or whatever the words were in those days. And uh, I'm enrolling you. She enrolled me. I was 17 right. years old. So, 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 Mark, there's a possibility if that didn't happen, you may have been a builder, you, you know, competitive entrepreneur. You might have had your own building company. Um, you, you know, you might have been Harry Triggerboff, but you might, you might, you might not have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, you know what I, I wanted to do, Tom? I wanted to play footy. So I was living in the Canary Banks Sand area. So I wanted to play rugby league for the for in those days. I called the Berries, but what we all know is the Bulldogs. So that's all I wanted. A lot of my mates ended up playing first grade uh, for the Canary Banks Sand team. Um, and I, you know, I, and they all worked as brickies or, you know, worked at the tax office or worked for the bank. And there were some blokes in those days worked for Rothmans and those sorts of people who used to sponsor football. Um, and or two is so yeah uh, that's that's what I want to do I mean it, it wasn't because I was lazy or I was whatever I just thought I just want to do what all my friends are doing like every kid I guess um I was pretty mature guy I wasn't very mature um uh, I wasn't and I, I definitely wasn't driven like you know I'm there's my goal I'm going for that 
But as I said, I was comp- I competed in everything, every single thing I could possibly do. I don't know why it's just a, it's just in my nature. I still I'm still the same. I'm still competitive. Now, Mark, some of the themes out of the book. Number one, think for yourself. In the book Rise, there's that theme about think for yourself, both in respect to thinking differently than others and in your position you don't like. Change your state of mind, do something. Add anything on that? Yeah, well, look, unfortunately today, because social media is a great thing, it, it connects us, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are very, very positive about it, but actually starting to, it's starting to form the way we think. So a lot of people... Well, what I'm saying is a lot of us don't sit down and sit back and read what we just saw and think about what we just saw instead of just having a reaction, by the way, because some people just think oh, social media means I should react. Whether you're reacting or going along with it, I'm saying analyse it, get another opinion, think about it. Sometimes you don't have to say anything at all. We don't have to react. Sometimes it's not worth spending the time on it. Think about what you're going to say, why you're going to say it, is it important, am I wasting energy on it, and learn and don't become... A lot of us think that social media allows us to think wide. In other words, think a bit broader. In actual fact, we are tending to think, uh, you know, in my view anyway, we start to think um, more um, in line with everybody by reading the social media and responding the way we do. So think for yourself on what anyone says, whether it's the prime minister, the treasurer, the local mayor, um, whether it's uh, Joe Biden in America, or whether it's Tom Panos or Mark Burris, Think about what we've had to say. Think where you sit in all that and try and think, is there something I need to, is there something I can do with this or is it valuable or is it not valuable? Otherwise, just leave it alone and get on with the next thing. So think for yourself. That's really important for me. Uh, I mean, I, I see people that just, oh, yeah, Mark, you said this. You know, I agree. Well, maybe it was not fucking right. Maybe it didn't fit for your life. I mean, I'm talking about what's good for me. And I, don't tell, I can't tell anybody what's good for them. I, I have not got a, got a clue what's good for anybody. All I know is what works for me. So understand that when Tom and me are speaking, it's what works for us. You think about where that fits fits into your regime. Gold. The next one is, Mark, you mentioned in the book about a stage uh, coup when you're younger. Um, Can you just, what's the story behind the coup? And um, yeah, what's that about? And what did you learn from it? Well, as I said earlier, I was 25 years of age. I was very immature. Even in those years, I was immature. Um, and uh, in, in terms of social development, because, you know, where I grew up, I didn't really have that good a social development. And I was working in, in those days. I, I just, I'd finished my accounting degree. I became, I did the chartered accounting course and I became very quickly was made a partner of an accounting firm, a chartered accounting firm. Um, and I was finishing my law degree off at night at university. And uh, um, I was, um, I was looking at all these people, how they live their lives. They had all had Mercedes Benz things I'd never seen before. And they went overseas on trips and et cetera. And uh, the senior partners of the firm were making much more money than the junior partners of the firm. I was one of the junior partners. Um, so I, uh, um, this is an example of not narcissism, but maybe a little bit of um, my competitive nature and, and probably um, not controlling myself, being impetuous um, and not being patient. Um, I called all the junior partners up. I rang them up those days, no emails or phones, et cetera, mobile phones. Um, had a meeting with them all secretly, covertly. Um, um, engage them to all come to a restaurant and meet with me. It was a, a restaurant down in um, called Grotto Capri. You probably remember it. Yeah. Um, in um, we sat, uh, hired a private room, we sat them all around there. There was four of us, junior partners. Um, and I said, we do all the work and the senior partners earn all the money. Well, our percentage is small relative to amount of fees we earn. If you compare the amount of fees they earn relative to the take home that they get. So I said, what we should do is we should take over the firm. And they all said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, we're just going to take it over. We're going to have a meeting. We're going to call. I said, I'm going to send out a, a letter to all our clients. Give me your client names and details. I sent a letter out to all our clients. Those days it was a physical letter. Um, send it all out. Invite them to a um, cocktail party, which we're going to hold at the old Wentworth Hotel, now the Soft Hotel. And uh, I'm going to announce that the name of the firm has changed to Boris Dowd and Vince from the old name. So wow. I said, I, uh, 25 years of age, I told everybody, and the, uh, all our customers and clients, et cetera, and they all congratulated. Oh, wow, what's this? Fan? And they said, well, what, where, you know, where are the other senior partners? Oh, I said, they're, they're okay, they're not coming. And then uh, we, uh, of course, you can imagine what happened when um, we worked up, that was on a Friday night, we rocked up to work on the Monday. Um, the senior partners of the firm were not all that impressed and because obviously they'd heard about it by this stage. And we just, they said to me, well, you got a bias. And I said, no, we don't. They're our clients. Um, and they said, no, you, you, that's not how it works. I said, well, I don't care how it works. Um, 
So it was, it, it was impetuousness. It was the wrong thing to do. Um, did, I you get, was, did you get sacked? Did you get sacked? No, no, no. no, no. The, firm, the firm became Boris Dan Vince. It existed. So what we did, we sat down with him. We did a deal and uh, we changed the name. And um, that was the name of the firm, Boris Dan Vince, for a couple of years, about four or five years. Um, and uh, But what we, one of the, the, the funny uh, part of all this, Tom, is that one of the reasons they were all working really hard on other stuff that wasn't generating fees for the firm we had this sort of trust thing on the side, you know, a trust entity on the side, which they were working on much more than uh, they're working on the partnership fees. And this trust, they when we did the split, um, they said, well, you guys can have the accounting firm, fair enough, which was called Boris and Vince. We were happy with that. And they said, we'll take the trust. You now we all own part of the trust too. But we said, okay, you can have that for nothing. That trust um, built um, some software and that became a company called Computer Share. Wow. World's largest share registry, wow. which we nothing of. And my impetuousness uh, created that situation, Tommy. And you know what? 18 months later, I was working in a law firm because 18 months later, I got bored with the accounting firm. So 18 months later, um, I got head under by a law firm and I went and worked in a law firm. Um, and uh, the, the firm kept my name, paid me a royalty for, for, for my name for a little while. And then they end up merging with somebody else, but the firm still exists today. It's been around for now about thirty-five what, years. What's the learning out? What, what, what was the learning there that you get? Well, uh, don't be impetuous. I mean, you can't build your empire because at that stage I started to get a bit ambitious, and my ambition was driven by seeing other people have things that I didn't have. And I want my ambition was to have a Mercedes Benz. My ambition was to have a house in Vaucluse not, you know, where I was living in Shitville. Um, my ambition was to, you know, to have what they had, basically. I thought, naively, that the way through to do this is stabbing everyone in the back and just carving them up on the way through. And, and you know, like, in, and that, that comes, as I said, right at the very beginning, we said right at the very beginning, that's not a way to sustain a life. I mean, that's, that's and in the, on the way through, through your impetuousness, through your treachery, my treachery, I missed something. I didn't even sit down and say, guys, what is it you're working on? Because they might have said, you know what, one day this thing we think it was going to become a great big um, share registry business. And if I had have sat down and been a bit patient, I might have said, oh, okay, fair enough. Well, we're happy to keep doing this. Let's make a few small changes around the edges. That that computer share, those guys that know the biggest shareholders in computer share today, today, that's a multi, multi-billion dollar company. The largest in Australia. There wouldn't be a company, a listed company in Australia who doesn't use computer share. Not one. Unbelievable. Mark, I want to ask you this. In the book, you mentioned Game of Thrones. You're making references uh, to Machiavelli, uh, San Tzu, Othello. Uh, you obviously get learnings and you get, you know, philosophies out of them. Is there anything at the moment you're reading or watching or you've read recently that you got, you know, a cracker idea? Well, the reason I look at, I love those things and I mention those, those books, movies, um, series is because I get fascinated, particularly with Machiavelli. I'm, I'm fascinated with the concept of treachery um, either. And I'm, uh, and, and, and treachery to me in, exists across the board in all business. Um, treachery towards your client, treachery towards your colleague, colleagues, treachery towards you, your boss, the business, the shareholders towards you, you towards the shareholders. And there's there's never enough balance between treachery and um, probably better behavior, good outcomes, and and you know like moral. Let's call it ethical behavior, not moral, but ethical. Can I ask you when you say the word treachery, what what does that mean to you? Looking after myself, but fuck you. Got you. Okay. You know, uh, and being nice to you at the same time. Yes. You know, like politicians are doing it all the time. You know, we saw yes. what Malcolm, what happened, to Malcolm Turnbull, and. Uh, and uh, Tony Abbott, like, I mean, one minute they're saying, look, I stand behind Tony Abbott, uh, uh, Mr. Turnbull, you know, I back him to, you know, to the end, nth degree. And like three weeks later, you are just kicked him out. And I mean, I, I don't want to pick on those two. I mean, that, this stuff exists all the time. And we've got to understand how treachery works. If you want to get to the top of your business, you, you know, you may well use a bit of treachery on the way through, but you got to remember there's going to, someone who's going to want to come and commit treachery on you. So you've got, I'm fascinated with how treachery works. Like the Game of Thrones to me was um, the, the, the game of treachery is probably another way for me. There was just treachery everywhere. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was fascinating. It was a bit of a comical thing from like a, a lot of people think, why are you watching that? But I just thought the people who wrote it are brilliant 
in terms of building treacherous situations all the time. And then people backing on, onto each other and backing out of each other and, uh, you know, carving each other up. The next minute, they know their best mates, their best friends, they're helping each other. And this shit happens. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's normal. For me, it's normal. Um, and we have to understand it. And we can get it out of books and television. So Machiavelli's a great example. Like Machiavelli, um, everybody thinks, we talk about Machiavellian principles, and uh, a lot of people refer to Machiavellian principles as the way the Labor Party used to operate in, in Australia. But Machiavelli actually wrote a series of letters to his prince. And I've got the, I've read the, not all the letters, I've read most of the letters. And um, they, they, they are they container books. And he's continually telling the prince about what happens when you do a takeover, when you take over someone's territory, how you then deal with the people in the territory, A, how you take it over, and then like it could be a, 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 a physical one, like a war, or it could be you know, through coercion, et cetera. But then how you treat them in order to bring them to your kingdom. Um, and when I had the wizard business, I used to give all the young rising stars in my business the book, and I say, read it. You must read this book, yeah. and and they all read it, and they and some of them read it over and over again. I used to read it over and over again, over and over again. The greatest example of treachery is the New Testament, <laughs> the the Gospels. Like Jesus was subject to treachery. Yes, I mean it's a it's a you know allegedly the greatest story ever told. It still is. I mean we're still talking about it today. You know, it's at least two thousand odd years later. So treachery exists. And I, I, as I said, I find it fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating, the psychology of it, and just watching people manoeuvre. And sometimes you have to be a bit treacherous in business, and there's nothing wrong with it. But don't be a treacherous person. Respect so, that thing. So, so, Mark, as you're talking, um, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind is you, certain, you sometimes hear in, in, in thought leaders or sometimes I'll hear a podcast and you hear that, you know, people say, yeah, you should be a bit paranoid. You should you should be a little bit paranoid, you know, that, you know, that someone's scheming or or someone's trying to do that or someone, yeah. Um, and then on the other hand, like, I don't want to have insomnia, Mark. So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> on the one hand, I want to be paranoid because you should be worried that people are trying to do you over. But on the other hand, you want to sleep. Well, Tommy, yeah. And I, my, I have a solution for it. It's, it's taken me a long time to, to, to work it out. But the way you deal with obsession, you should have a bit of obsessiveness to be successful in business. You must have a bit of obsession with what you're doing. Um, you must have a bit of paranoia. And I, I refer to these things as managed paranoia, managed obsession. And you actually have to understand how you create a state of mind. How you get your mindset, we, a lot of people refer to this mindset. I like to call it a state of mind. It's you have to recognize that this is, I'm now going to be, this is a bit of paranoia. I'm going to exercise paranoia for a while. And then I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to put it over here in a box, close the box. I'm just going to shelve it, push it down the other end of the shelf. And other times I'm being obsessive. I'm being obsessive in my business. Okay, I'll, not, it's time not to be obsessive now. Pick it up, move it across. There's states of mind which you move around. There's a very famous movie uh, called Being There, B E I N G T H E R E. Peter Sellers is in it. And right. Peter Sellers, right at the very end, Peter Sellers is a simpleton, actual grows up as a, you know, it might be yeah, like slightly backward in his learning ability. And he gets uh, uh, cast as a, a fully grown adult, mid, mid, you know, mid 40s, maybe 50s, wearing a full suit as a gardener, though, doing the gardening. And that's all he knows in his whole life. And then someone mistakes him for being a very famous economic guy called Chauncey Gardner. And all Peter Sellers can talk about when he when, when he's talking to the president of the United States is about how the garden works in the winter. In other words, all the leaves fall out and there's no fruit. And what you've got to do to the garden during the winter, Mr. President, is you've got to look after the roots and you've got to build everything underground. You've got to make the infrastructure really good. And the president's going, that's brilliant, Chauncey Gardner, not realising he's talking to a simpleton, thinking he's talking to an economic professor, Chauncey Gardner. And uh, he's saying to Chauncey, Chauncey Vergardner, <clears throat> That's brilliant. You're right. We've got to spend money on infrastructure. And I'm going to tell everybody if there's an upcoming election. I'm going to tell everybody how to do this. And of course, there's a comedy and Peter Sellers carries it off absolutely brilliantly. Shirley MacLaine's in it as well. It's, it's the funniest movie. It's not great in terms of acting, but it's a funny movie. But the story behind it, right at the very end, you think that Peter Sellers is going to die. He gets very ill. And you see him walking down to the water, down to a beautiful lake, a very calm lake. And he's got, a, he's got his three-piece piece suit on and a boater hat on. And he's walking down towards what he thinks. Oh, he's just going to walk in the water and drown. And he's walking towards what he starts walking on the water. 
with his thing and he turns around very cheekily and the little caption comes up, life is a state of mind. Beautiful. State of mind. You want to employ obsession because it's a good thing to employ, have it in your state of mind. You want to employ paranoia because it's a good thing to have at worst because it makes you test your, your hypothesis. Good. Employ paranoia with a state of mind then push it down the, down the end of the bookshelf. And all those things, do them, do them as a part of your state of mind and have all these parked in your environment and use them when you need them. Even a little bit of treachery helps. Love it. Mark, last thing I want to talk to you about is this concept in the book about building a, a, a tribe, actually the word you use is an army of business warriors, an army of business warriors. What does that mean? Like, so I'm thinking to myself, Mark, like I, I, I get the concept and I, I love the concept that you're giving every person on the planet that reads the book hope. It doesn't matter where you start. This is what I've done. This is what worked for me. And you're giving them uh, it's like having breakfast with, that's what it would feel like. Reading your book would be like having breakfast with Mark Burris, right? But this concept of, hey, we need to build uh, a, a, an army of business warriors. What's that about? Well, we, like Tommy, we need, to, um, we need momentum as business owners. I mean, we get kicked in the guts. You know, premiers make decisions about what's going to, what they think is best for the nation. And then certain people have to make greater sacrifices than other people. And then we all expected just to cop it on the chin. And it's not just through the COVID period I experienced this, but it was amplified during the COVID period. But I've seen this all through his, like all through my, my, my business history. You know, business owners, if they employ so many people, have to pay payroll tax. Well, what a nonsense. What, what, what are you joking me? I get a tax because I've, I'm, I'm, I'm employing people or I'm a landholder. I've got to pay land tax. Are you joking? Um, because I own land, I'm getting penalised because I own land because of what I'm richer than somebody else or I might have mortgages on everything. It just doesn't make sense, okay? So I'm saying to all these people who are working their butts off to get somewhere to achieve something, I'm saying, why don't we all join together? I don't want to become a political party. I have no interest in going into politics and I don't want this to be a political party. But what would happen if we, there was a platform it's not LinkedIn, it's not some platform, what do we call it? Business Warrior Platform, come up with a name, whatever. And we all join this platform and we use this platform for one thing and one thing alone. Every time there was a proposed decision that's going to affect us as business owners, we all vote on it across the country. Every one of us uh, registers, yes. there's two five million of us and they employ another three million people. Five million people are on this thing. We all put $1 into it as part of our registration, just $1 every year, $1. It's 5 million bucks. They can employ a whole lot of people. They can run it, run the platform. Software developers can develop the platform and they can curate every important issue that gets raised. So when Palaszczuk puts up a note about um, closing the borders and, uh, you know, it's going to affect everybody in Southeast Queensland, this is, say, late last year, we can all vote on it. And imagine if 5 million people or 4 million people or 2 million people in Queensland told her that's all shit. She changed her tune pretty bloody quick. And then, or she'd reconsider a position, or she might even enter into a bit of a debate with them, or at least give everybody a chance to talk about it. Or when Scott Morrison says, um, I'm going to uh, reduce the income tax rate for business owners from 27% to 25%, we might say, that's wonderful. Or alternatively, we might say, you know what, we reckon it should be 22%. How can we have a discussion about that? And maybe the discussion says you should tax Google more or the banks more and tax us less because we don't earn as much money so it's you know what well, i don't see why there's a progressive tax rate when it comes to individuals there's no progressive tax rate when it comes to companies or businesses i don't understand that concept if progressive tax rates are equitable for individuals in other words i pay more taxes as an individual than say someone who earns a lot less than me then yeah. if a company earns a lot a, a business owner earns a lot less and turns over a less than another business owner then how come the, ta the progressive tax rate is not equitable for them i don't get it that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, something that I, 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 I haven't really thought of, but you make a that's, a... that's a valid point, Mark. That's a valid point. When, uh, talk about it, Tommy. Look, and I'm just saying, let's have a platform. There's platforms where we can talk about everything. I'm just saying, let's have one for all business owners. All of us can join. Put a buck in. You know, and like yeah, every time there's a, a, a vote, or something we should vote, and we'll, and we'll hand it over to Scott Morris and say, here, look at this. You know what? The media... Every time they talk about it, we'll go straight to the platform and find out what we all think. And yeah. they'll write about it, as opposed to the media giving us their opinion on what they think. When, they, as you say, most of them have never been in business. They've spoken to like two and a half people, and they think that's a, a survey. 
And I, I'm just sort of, and that, I guess that's what I'm trying to say about think for ourselves. I want to not only think, for, I don't, I only want, I, I don't only want business owners to think for themselves. I want us to act for ourselves. And this is the next step. I'm sort of saying, well, what do you guys think? If you want to do it, let's do it. I'm happy to help out. I'll, I'll get involved. I'll push it. I'll drive the shit out of this, you know, like, I, cause I really believe in it. I mean, I, but I'm not going to do it if no one else else gives a shit. And it, what it could be Tom too, it could be Australians we don't care about things like that. So it could be a position, and I'll cop that sweet. But if we don't care, that's fine too. But if we care, then let's do it. I'll, I'll lead this army. Well, I can tell you the people that are watching this and will be watching it um, after, um, the, some watch it live, some watch it afterwards in their own time, they are people that are a business people majority are real estate agents there's a lot of mortgage brokers um some of them own offices and some of them are sales people that work in businesses but they run like they if you're a salesperson working in a business you're basically you know you're a business within the business and as you said we're all working for ourselves so what's the fun if someone wanted to read rise What's the fastest way to get a copy of Rise? Is it, is, what do you do? You go on to Amazon or you go to, uh, how's this book? Booktopia, book, you get it on Booktopia, um, Amazon, but Booktopia, be, it's you know, Booktopia spelled as it sounds. Um, it's, you can go to the bookstores, it got it to most of the bookstores at the moment. Um, but I, as I understand, Booktopia is the best place to go and order it online. And, uh, and, and by the way, I dedicated the, 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 to this guy. Can you see this guy here, Tommy? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. That's, that's my dad. That's your dad. So can I just confirm your your dad's your dad's on the right with the white shirt? Yeah, that's my old man. That's me and dad, and that's my dad, George Boris. And uh, my mum passed away from M and D two years ago, but dad's still alive. He's in his eighty late eighties. And um, and if it wasn't for him and my mum, um, you know, that's the most. Some people put um pictures, like, you know, pictures of art they love behind them. I I was thinking, what am I going to bring in to talk to Tom with? And I thought I'll bring dad's picture in. Um, that's my old man. Like he's the inspiration of my life today. Every single day, I go and see him every Saturday, mate. If I can end up half as good a person as him and have a half as good a life as he's got now, I'll be happy. That's uh, Mark. I've got. I've. I've got to. I've got to say, you're a. You're a good son. So every Saturday, you're out to. Have you? Have you? Um. Have you ever gone um, overseas with your dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. I've been to Greece with dad. Um, and uh, he doesn't like traveling that much, Tom, but, uh, you know, Carlo Plevi, uh, uh, Carlo Plevi, like it's, uh, st- uh, means good child. <laughs> you know, I always want to be that person for my dad. Like uh, I want to be this person. I want to be a good child. Uh, I still do. I don't think we lose the boy or girl in us, no matter how old we get. I, I haven't. I mean, I need to ask you, Tommy, what did you do today in training? Can I ask you a question? What training session did you do this morning? Bikram. I'm hooked. So I'm, I'm, I'm Mark. So what happened is on March 8th, when I came back from Christchurch and it was my last, my last flight, because a lot of my work was based around on flights. Then on March 8th, there's no flying, got used to the Zoom, worked out. I've got a subscription online business. So that kept me busy. And I had a lot of time on my hands. I walked into a Bikram studio um, and um, I've pretty much done Bikram since then, I, I do Bikram four to five times a week. It's it's yoga, but it's it's not a soft yoga. I'm not into Mark. Not that I'm not a spiritual person, but I'm not into the spiritual type, you know, chakra type. There, Bikram. Yeah. So you, you've heard of Bikram? I've done, I've done Bikram. Okay. I've, so Mark, what did you think of Bikram? Um, uh, I didn't like the the the, uh, the one I did was a super hot one, um, and I did in Byron. Um, uh, I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I do like um, uh, Ash, Ash, Ashtanga and I like vinyasa. I like movement yoga um, where, where I'm moving all the time. But I just don't like getting overheated. And um, I don't know whether this is normal, but I, I was looking to that everyone had a bottle of water. I didn't take a bottle of water because I didn't know. Uh, but but, um, but the, the lady who was taking the class actually got up a few people when they tried to take a drink. So there's actually a, a, an organized drink, a drink period. So it's pretty, it's pretty uh, regimental uh, as but- I understand. So, Mark, I wear my Apple Watch when I most of the time, right? I'm not wearing it now, but in the day, everything I do, I wear the Apple Watch. So, with Bikram, the first, the first, look, the teacher, Brad, I said, to, he said to me, listen, don't quit after five. He goes, I'm letting you know because you're going to hate it. Don't quit after five, right? 
Um, and I hated it at the start. And it had a bit of a cult feel to it because you're not allowed to leave the room. You can't have a drink when you want to have a drink. It seemed to sort of have this sort of guru, follow me, you can't do anything else. But since then, what I've, it's worked for me, Mark. I get two hours where no one can contact me. I get two hours where I can basically do a, a delete of the inbox. Everything that happens, I delete it. It's a detox. It's a facial. Um, it's uh, time to myself. Oh, I torch. Put it this way. The Bay Run, 45-minute run. I'll burn 750 calories. Uh, Bikram, I never burn anything under 1,200 calories. The heat... Wow. The the heat, the heat just gets your heart ache. And 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 it's damn, I gotta tell you, if you do the poses, they're damn hard not getting into the pose, but staying in the pose. So I love, I love Bikram's my thing at the moment. Um, I still do any time. I go to five dock at any time fitness, you know, most most mornings. But um so since I last saw you, which would have been six months ago, and by the way, six months ago, the, the, the best piece of advice you've ever given me was I'll never forget as I was walking away, you said to me, don't take for granted how many more summers you've got left in your life. I, I, won't, for, I, won't, for, I, I won't forget that. I won't forget I, that. I, that way, by the way. <laughs> because uh, what, I, what happened after that is I left and I said to myself, that's it, June 2, to end of August, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to mainly Greece and I do a little bit of um, the rest of Europe. It's not gonna happen now because Mark, it's unlikely June, July, August this year Europe's on the cards. You reckon? One hundred percent. It's not 100%. gonna happen. Well, if you go, you won't be coming back. <laughs> so, Mark, can I can I ask you? So that's so since you last saw me. I reckon I've, look, I've shed about 15, 15 K since you last saw me. Mate, right? I follow you on your, on your Instagram. I see, I see some of the um, uh, stories you put up. You look fantastic. That's why I want to know what you're doing because you look really good. It looks like you're sometimes doing two sessions a day. Yeah. So any, I do the weights in the morning and I do, and then I do the, the Bikram at around five, five, five o'clock. And I end up, I, the other thing it helps me, it's, it helps me sleep a lot. And the other thing is it, I've never been able to meditate. I've, everyone talks about it, but I've actually found during Bikram, I'm so tired that I just want to stay alive. I've got no time to think of paranoia. I've got no time. <laughs> like, like you can't get paranoid because you think you're going to die. The only thing you're paranoid about is getting through the class. So you just <laughs> fuck, fuck, focus. But can I, can I ask you, you would have to be, in, in your age, the fittest guy I know, right? You, 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 like, you look fit. Can I ask you, in a typical week, seven days... What does training look like for you? Uh, depends if I'm getting ready to fight for a fight or not. But um, if I'm not, if it's just if it's just a normal period, um, I train every day. Maybe have one day off, um, but I train for about just 45, 50 minutes each each session. But I go and I go hard, really hard. Um, I, 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 if I don't sweat, I'm upset. Um, so I, I go really hard. I don't do much much in terms of weights, but I, I do a lot of. Uh, heart lung stuff you know running and you know boxing hit the pad skipping you know all that sort of stuff um and then if i'm preparing for a fight um depending if i'm going to lose weight or put weight on depending what division i'm fighting um i i tend to do a little, a little i do strength work as well as aerobic work and in those days i'll train twice a day every second day i don't have a day off but i but i will run every day uh, but not long i'll run for five k's that's it um four five k's i don't go on a long run because I get injuries too easy. Um, but I just, so I, I but I, I love it. I mean, I'm an intense person by nature. Um, so when I, I do something, I do it in everything I do intensely. And I, do, I competing with myself the whole time. I'm always, like today I trained twice. Today I did weights in the morning and later in the afternoon I did, um, you know, a shadow boxing, hit the bag, um, you know, I did rowers, various other things. But, uh, and I, but I only went for 45 minutes. So this morning I did a maybe 45 minutes in the weights and 45 minutes this afternoon. I do like yoga and I've started to take it, take it back up. Um, I haven't done it for a long, long time. I did it for a lot. I did a lot of yoga maybe 10 years ago um, for a period of 10 years. Um, and I, uh, for a, bit, a whole lot of reasons, I stopped doing it. But um, I've been getting a little bit of stiffness. So I have been, I have decided I'm going to go back to it. Um, and I'm going to actually introduce it in my at work. 
and I'm going to get someone to come in and off, um, sort of take all the young people who work for us and show them, you know, teach them once a week and I'll join those classes. I'll probably just start off with some Hatha just to get moving a bit. Um, I know it's going to kill me. Um, I'm strong, but yoga is a different sort of strength. It's, it's a bit weird. I, I, it's, it's just a different strength. As you say, holding a pose. Yeah. It's pretty difficult um, for those people who haven't done it um, and for those people who haven't done it too. There's, there's a guy called Ed that I know. His brother, is a, it might be Billy Billy Dib. And he's I, name, Yeah, a boxer. He a was boxer. a world, world title. Okay, so I think that's the one. Ed, I think Ed's his brother. If I've made a mistake with the boxer, I'm pretty sure it is him, right? Ed said to me that... Um, his brother uh, was absolutely um, getting a lot of benefit out of the Bikram yoga, and the reason why is the 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 heat the heat allows you to stretch a muscle a lot more. Like like Mark, I've got to tell you, the I get a bit of tightness around glutes and hammies, right? And to be able with the heat because that stretches around 45 minutes in the class. So you're really, really warm by then to be, a, I mean, I just, I just feel like it's the best stretch possible. And the weirdest thing is even with after burning 12, 1300 calories, you can rock up the next day and keep going because it doesn't have the issues of the, the pain that you get with joints and, yeah. you know, you, you know, the knees <laughs> and all that stuff and shoulders and all that. Yeah, that's one of the another reason because I mean that's why I don't do heavy weights anymore because I, yeah, I get in you know I get sore I don't I sound like feeling being sore getting you get out of bed in the morning you can't move, and that's another reason I want to, I want to take up the yoga. It's funny Billy Dib um, is actually having a, a he's got a fight coming up in uh, two or three weeks. Um, that's interesting that he's doing yoga Bikram yoga um, because he would be training the house and he'd be doing three hours training every day at the moment because you know he was he was he held, he was a world champion Billy at one stage. Uh, maybe about five years ago, and then he's then he he stopped fighting and he's made a comeback. I know him quite well, Billy. He's a, a lovely guy. His brother a, was a fighter too, I think. There might be a few of them in the family. Yeah. One, at least one of his brothers was a fighter. Um, yeah, he's he's a he's a good a good young boy. When I say young boy, he's probably uh, when you when when you when you're um uh getting ready for a. Uh, by the way, how many rounds do your fights go for? Um, it well it depends. So uh, if I'm if I'm fighting in a tournament, it's th only three two three two minute rounds. But sometimes I've I've done six fours, uh, four fours, five fours. Um, it depends if I'm doing an exhibition. They're usually four or five rounds, an exhibition, but a proper fight. But just you know, fighting with somebody just to do an exhibition. Like I've, I've done exhibitions with all sorts of people, like Danny Green. I've done an exhibition with um, um, Garth Wood. Um, and they were they were four uh, four they were four three minute rounds. But generally speaking, if I'm in a competition, like on a masters event, it's uh, three twos. Um, can I ask you, out of a hundred percent in a boxing fight, how much mental, how much physical? Like if you turn around, how much is psychological? How much is actual uh, physical fitness? What combination? Yeah. Do you Gen generally speaking. Um, I would have to say I'd expect, but I've been doing this all my life. Um, I would expect the person I'm opposing, generally speaking, um, would to be exactly the equal fitness to me. There would be it'd be marginal, marginal extra fitness. You know, I tend to get pretty fit, but it only be marginal in terms of the benefit. It's all it's all in your head. So the rest of it's all in your head, the whole lot. Um, you know, what do you do? Do you brawl the guy? Do you um, you know do you suss him out or? Do you chase them? Do you, you know, let them come onto you? Do you um, want to counter punch them or do you want to be first? Um, what happens when they hit you on the chin, like uh, when they, or they hit you in the face? Uh, as, as Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face, you know, and, and it does make a difference to the, to your outlook in the in the fight. Um, and it's happened to me many times. Um, you know, like you have to sort of control yourself and make sure you don't want to go back and square up. Or alternatively, they might have knocked you a bit of sense out of you. So in those cases, you tend to, uh, you've got to regather yourself and, and maybe just last at the end of the round so you can sit down and have a you know, bit of water and cool down a bit. Um, you know, a lot of blokes, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was watching the UFC fight, Conor McGregor fought um, um, Dustin Poirier today. Um, and, Did you watch um, that fight? Yeah, I watched it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Why, 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 why do you think that happened there in the second round? What do you think? I, I, I Look, fighting whether it's boxing or ufc it only takes one punch um one good punch well in their case it could be a kick but one good hit and priory just got one good one right on um 
right on um, uh, uh, McGregor's chin or just to the side here. And then that just stunned him a bit. And, and Poirier had the um, um, mind to, to then to jump all over him. He thought, well, that, here's my chance. It's a bit like in business, you know. You get that one opening, you've got yeah. to be all You've got to be fit enough to be all over it. You've got to be physically and mentally fit. And in business, that means you've got to know your subject matter. You've got to be personally fit and, you know, can't have a hangover. You have to have had enough sleep. Um, you, you, but you've got to be all over the situation. Like, you know, you get an opportunity with, you know, a vendor who's going to sell something and you see that door, door open a little bit. You've got to get through there. Yes. You know, and the door doesn't always open. And sometimes you've got to pry the door. I mean, you've got to be a bit patient to get the door open. So, you know, probably was just playing with him a little bit. Um, I actually thought McGregor was on top, but that just sometimes it's just that one punch, that one hit um, can change the whole course of your life to some extent. And that happens in business all the time. So, you know, McGregor's going to go back now and his wife's going to say, well, you know, do, is it worth it? Why are you doing it? Um, should you come back now? He's gone from his rank was ranked number four in the lightweight division, um, which is currently um, dominated by um um, Adesano, by Israel Adesano, the guy out of New, um, New Zealand, he must be sitting back to himself saying, well, you know, this is going to be mine for a while. So well, I guess what McGregor was trying to do is be Poria, who's number one contender, and then get become the contender for the lightweight division again and maybe hopefully fight Adesano. Um, but now he's lost. His whole world's changed. And that's what happens when you learn lose. And it's funny, I interviewed John Kavanagh, who's um, um, uh, McGregor's coach. I interviewed him this week. Last week in Abu Dhabi, right on my, on one of my straight talks, which I did with you. Yes. And um, he said to me, um, the, one of the most important things that Conor McGregor is brilliant at, brilliant at is he never loses. He wins or learns. Never win or lose. It's win or learn. And it's going to be interesting to see whether, and actually John Kavanaugh wrote a book, a very successful book called Win or Learn. And it's going to be interesting to see whether Conor learns, what Conor learns from this is not, will he learn from what he learns from it and what he how he puts it in action and he might learn it's time to give up stop i've got enough money i've you know i've done enough i've won three divisions no one else has um you know like no one else has done the ufc so um loser. mark he's not a sore loser because i read quickly the press just before he got on i i read the the press and he's sort of he wasn't a sore loser he actually said mate the guy's a good fighter he, i think in summary he said i thought i was on top of him in the first round um um, he's not a, you know, he's a pretty good fighter. I hadn't, I think he said I hadn't been in a proper fight for a year. I think yeah, more than, more than, more than a year. Cause he had one, well, no, it's about a year now. Yeah. He fought that bloke, but the guy he beat last year, he beat him in about like really quickly. It was, and he remember, I don't know if you remember, saw that fight, but he hit him in the shoulder a couple of times last year. And then he, then he just knocked him out. So I don't think he was really tested. Um, I agree with you. Oh, look, I, it's funny, you know, like I've been watching Trump and there's something about, um, someone else winning and you being gracious about it and then being able to go and learn and, and make a comeback or learn from that and go on to do other things. I mean, I, I think too many of us um, can easily get too dejected. And when I, when I talk about being ambitious and, and being obsessive, it doesn't mean you can be a bad loser. An obsessive person shouldn't be a bad loser. An obsessive person should be about doing the good, a good thing. And part of the obsession should be about making sure you, you know, congratulate somebody like uh, McGregor did with Poirier today. Like you said, he's a good fighter and, and gave him, and then, uh, and, you know, like Trump should have done the same about Biden. Biden won. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. He got inaugurated. He's, he's the president. Say good on you, mate. And then just work it up. If you want to compete with him, come back again later. But don't make a gig of yourself. All right. An absolute legend, guys. And by the way, Susan, um, I know. Uh, can you please in the in the messages and in the comments, Susan, please type in um, uh, Utopia, um, but they can get it. Booktopia. What is, book, Booktopia. Sorry, book, Booktopia. If they could put it in there, so it's, it's probably Booktopia.com. But Susan will quickly yeah. look it up and make sure that it's there. And what I'm going to do is, um, I want if the people who share this video, because if you see the theme of what this is about is build a tribe that's got our vibe, build a tribe that's got a vibe. Now, if you're going to share the video, I will pick one person and I'll announce them in the next 48 hours. So all you got to do is press the share button and put down in there what you loved about this interview. And I will give them um, a free copy of the book, but the price I'll write something in it for you. Why don't we both throw something in there for him? 
You Perfect. write something. So now, Mark, your book, uh, Mark, I'm going to give you the name of the person. You're going to write something there Beautiful. and we're going to send it. So they're going to get a personally signed book from Mark, Rise. And uh, Mark, thanks again. You've always been very generous with your time to me. And um, I think, uh, mate, I just think to myself that we can relate to what you're talking about because I know the pain and suffering that my clients have, particularly during this COVID period where we had premiers that were controlling their destiny. Um, I mean, there were, there were real estate people in Melbourne that didn't sell a home for five months, Mark, and they had landlords. They had, you know, to, to pay people's uh, 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 various wages. I mean, JobKeeper obviously off, offset some of these, but um, you feel the pain and suffering of these people. Totally, and I, 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 and I, and I just think Tommy's not enough for me. For me, I don't feel that I'm doing enough just by empathising. So I'm actually putting myself out there and saying, let's do something about it. So when this happens again, or if it ever happens again, we're going to be able to have a say in what decisions, and that's what democracy is about. What decisions are made about things that affect us in the in our business and our hard earned? Because you know, God knows we work hard. God knows we we deserve everything we earn, and we don't want someone just to take it away from us or just pull the rug from under us just because it's, they want to make, make some decision or make some political statement. That's all I wanted to do. That's what Rise is all about. Rise up. Rise up. Thank you so much from the great man, guys and girls, signing off. Press the share video. Mark, thanks a lot. You're training tomorrow or you got a day off? No, I train tomorrow, mate. I'm on. I, mate, by the way, Tommy, you inspire me. So I'm going to be training. I'm going to train even harder tomorrow. I love that, mate. Mark, if I can look like you in the next one or two years, I've got to tell you, I'm making up for lost. I'm making up for lost time because look, when you're going, when you go through chemo, you know the the nine months of chemo, you cop it there. Then you go back and you realize, man, all your muscle tissue's been chewed up by the by the poison, and you start again. Um, so then when you when when you when you've got a, a free free card and in some respects COVID's been a gift that's been badly wrapped because one of the things it's done is it's actually pr allow, allowed allowed me to have more time and still uh, still get by. I mean, Mark, I mean, I know that you miss him emotional contagion being in front of people, but you know, Zoom has actually made a little few efficiencies there, hasn't it? Hundred percent. This I know. This is a, a live feed. So I mean, I, I I think that we've all we can still do events in, in person, but we would never have done this sort of thing if but for COVID. So we now got another um, you know uh, feather in our cap. You know, we got another skill we've learned. Um, we've got a, a, and there's more platforms building up. There's not only Zoom. There's a number of these platforms, but you know we we become familiar with them, and I, I quite like it. Um, and to some extent, I quite like sitting here in uh, you know one of the rooms at my place with the white wall behind me and uh, just chatting on a Sunday night. Otherwise, I would have had to come to a studio with you. Are and you, I'm, are you gonna, are you going to still when, when this vaccine gets rolled out? Are you still going to go off and do the conference speaking uh, yeah. when you get asked? Yeah, totally. I love it. I, I get so energized from that time. Like. Like I'm a pretty shy guy, um, like in social environments. But when I get on that stage, oh my god, the the adrenaline and the buzz I get out of it, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I get so excited, and I get so excited by the looks on people's faces, and when I can capture the their thoughts, and then I'm sort of feeding stuff to them, and I can see them sort of feeding back to me with the way they look at me. I, I, I absolutely love it. I'm exhausted when I get off stage. I, sometimes I talk for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, depending on how long I've been booked for. But I. I, I just get so excited and and, and so enthused, um, and maybe I shouldn't do as do as much as I do, but yeah, it, it keeps me going, mate. I like, I absolutely. I, 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 I remember speaking at a conference just after you in Queensland many years ago, Mark. And what happened is, um, we hadn't got really to know each other by then, but it was for I think it was the Real Estate Institute of Queensland, and I was sitting side of stage where you know where you sit next to the AV person and you're waiting for the other person. You're just sitting there, and the event organizer or one of the event people comes up to me and he says, "She says to me, Tom, I'm letting you know this is a they're a, a pretty conservative crowd." Um, just be careful uh, with your language because I used to occasionally swear swear in in some of the 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 I'll speak just the way I'd speak to my friends I would speak on stage 
And then I go, yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all good. I understand what you're saying. She goes, so just please tame the language down. And then as she said that, as she said that, the f bombs started coming coming out of your mouth, and I thought, I thought, I said, hey, listen, I'm not your problem today, right? <laughs> I got to say too, I'm glad you raised it because I have to issue a warning. If you're a, a snowflake and you don't like swearing, don't get my book, please. Don't because I swear all the fucking way through it, <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> and I throw every word in the dictionary out there. So. Uh, you know, I, I even got tapped on the shoulder by the editor a few times. They said, do you really want to use that word there? I said, yeah, that's a, that's a word I'm using. I don't use it to abuse people. I never do. But I'm, I use it as an expressive word when I, as I said, I get excited. I get excited and I, get, I say what I think. But, I can't. But, 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 but I think you also use it because from what I know of you, Mark, you are not a different person to different people, more or less you're the same, right? Yeah. You, you know, you're obviously, you're intelligent enough to know that you might have to deliver something a little bit differently, but generally speaking, you are the same person. So what you say in the book and what you say on the stage is probably what you say to someone in a cafe. It's the same and, person. And, and, and there's not enough for me anyway, or one of the, one of the most successful things about people on social media for, so one of the, important features of people who are successful in social media is authenticity. And, and to me, it's really important to be authentic. Um, I, I just see that's an ethic of mine, try to be authentic. And that means be consistent the same to everybody, to where, whoever you talk to. The only person I would never have sworn in front of was my mum. Um, but other than that, um, it's, it's, or, you know, my grandma. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, it's okay. All righty gang, by the way, Instagram and LinkedIn is the best way to consume nuggets of Mark. Um, and, uh, mate, thank you so much. Have a great night. Everyone's signing off. See you, Tom. Mark, I, I won't ring you up now. I'll let you go to sleep. We'll talk in the next week or so. See you, champ. See you, Bye, brother. Mate. Bye, mate.